Lord Jesus, thank you, God, that you are present. Thank you, Father, that you're here with us. Lord, thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, thank you that you uh, desire uh, a relationship with us, Father, that, Lord, you shed your blood so that that thing that stopped us from having a relationship with you called sin could be dealt with so that on the other side of that, Father, we could come back into relationship with you. So, God, I thank you that this morning you are willing and, uh, Father, you're here and you want to speak to us, Lord. So, God, we just commit this word into your hands, Father. I pray let your word do what your word does, transform, change, and mould us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now, firstly, let me see if I can get my technology going, because that's always a, a bit of an issue. Uh, here we go. Here we go. I've got some thoughts here. So we've been talking... Um, for the last uh, probably three weeks, we've been looking at Philippians chapter 3, and um, Luke is going to go as madly as he can to try to keep up with any scriptures because I didn't give him anything to put on the screen. But Luke's amazing. Who thinks Luke's amazing? I think Luke's absolutely amazing. Uh, Mr. Fix-It Man, he's uh, in a good way, and not a bad way. You're Mr. Fix-It Man, I'll fix it for you. In a good way, he's the Mr. Fix-It Man, and uh, does so much for the church behind the scenes there, behind that the big wooden wall. Um, so if you can keep up, you can, but if not, Luke, that's all good, mate. I, my bad, I didn't get a chance to get him to you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. And Paul, he says, not that I've already obtained all this. He's just gone on and talked about this goal that he's reaching for, this thing that is, he's trying to acquire and get a hold of. He says, not that I've already obtained it. I haven't got there yet. Or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on. To take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I love I love the humility of Paul. I mean, this is a guy that raised dead people, right? He raised dead people through the power of the Holy Spirit. This guy saw lepers cleansed, he saw blind eyes open. This guy stood in places where nobody had ever stood before and preached a message about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that he was crucified, buried, resurrected. He saw Churches planted. He saw people come to faith that had no background in, in, in the Christian faith. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned, imprisoned. He had all these things that had happened to him. Uh, he had stood very firmly and grounded in what he believed to be true. Amen? I mean, this is a picture of a guy that was not going to back down no matter what happened. It doesn't matter what you did to him. He was not going to deny the reality of Jesus in his life. He was not going to deny the fact that this Jesus that history tells us walked and taught and was a great teacher and so on, this Jesus that every major religion in the world actually has in their hierarchy of gods, it's a good move they do it because you can't exclude the reality of Jesus. So every major religion has him in there somewhere. Every major religion does not have Allah. It does not have Buddha. It does not have Krishna or Vishnu. But every major religion has Jesus. There's something about Jesus and Paul believes that there was something about Jesus to the point where he was killed in the end because he would not deny the reality of the fact that he saw with his own eyes a resurrected Jesus. Amen? He knew God. This guy gave his life for God. And yet here he is with all this confidence and understanding of the reality of God and that God is there and that everything that we read about and we hear about is true. Paul was humble enough to go, even though that's all true, I still haven't quite made it yet. I've still got a little bit of a way to go. Who feels like they've still got a little bit of a way to go? Good. And if you don't, I want to pray for you. Okay, I want to pray for you because none of us have made it. Amen? And it's not a bad thing to be humble enough to say, I'm not the finished product yet. In fact, you're not going to be the finished product this side of heaven because the polish we need to get the most shine out of you doesn't exist in this realm. It exists on the other side. You can't buy it here. So we're all going to, in one sense, I guess, limp our way towards eternity and limp our way into heaven. But it's not about getting there and who's the strongest and who's the toughest and who doesn't have a limp. It's about getting there. It's about knowing God. It's about journeying on in this life and taking the most of the time we have to get to know God, to get to experience God, and to share that with other people. Amen? That's that's what it's about. And we looked the other day at at, at last week at what Paul talked about. He, He said three things here. He said that I've let go of the past. 
and I'm pressing forward to reach this goal. And last week we looked at what the goal was and the goal was simple. The goal was not some big ministry. The goal was not a platform. The goal was not a spiritual gift. The goal was to know Jesus, to know Christ and Him crucified, to know the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings and to be conformed into His likeness and into His image. That was the goal of Paul. This guy here that said, I haven't made it yet. Where haven't I made it to? I don't fully know Him to the degree that I want to know Him yet. So I'm still moving forward to get to know Him. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I don't want to know religion. How many of you know that when Jesus came to walk this planet, there were thousands and thousands of religions already? He didn't come to say, hey, I've got a brand new religion. These other religions have been around for a long time. Let's upgrade religion, and I've got a new one, and we'll call it Christianity. He didn't come to give us a new religion. He came to show us what God was like. He came to reveal God to us. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, the words I speak, I don't just speak words of my own authority. He tells me and I say them. So so these guys that got to follow Jesus were following God. They got to see what God was like. They got to hear what God was like. Hear God's perspective on things. And it transformed their world. It wasn't just a bunch of information. God didn't say one day, for God so loved the world that he threw down a lovely leather-bound book in the hope that somebody would find it and read it to people. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sent a person, he sent Jesus down here to reflect to us and to show us what God was like. And Paul met that God. And Paul was radically, radically transformed from somebody that wanted to wipe this religion out from the face of the planet. He, if, if Paul had his way, you wouldn't be here today. If Paul had his way, none of you would be in this room because that was his goal. Think about that for a second. This guy who wrote probably two-thirds of the New Testament, this guy that we're speaking about and looking at his words now in 2022, this guy once upon a time wanted you not to exist. He wanted you not to exist. He didn't want you to be here. He wanted your life to be on some totally different trajectory, which would not have been the right trajectory because it would have been devoid of the only way to the Father, which is through Jesus. The only way to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, not I'm one of many ways. I'm a kind of truth. and Everyone's got their own truth. And I'm sort of like one of the ways. He said, no, no, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And that's the Jesus he's talking about. And he's saying, I'm on a journey. My goal is to know him, but I'm not quite there yet. Isn't it amazing what God can do with a person who wants to know him? I mean, here's Paul going, look, this is my goal. I want to know you, God. I want to know you, but I don't, I'm not there yet. But God goes, that's okay, because I'm not looking for people who are there yet. I'm just looking for people that want to know me. And and if I can find somebody that wants to know me, I can do amazing things with a person who wants to know me. Whether you're there or there or there, I don't care. It's about where are you looking and where are you focusing and what is your goal and, and, and what are you about? What are you about? Are we about the kingdom of God or are we about God's business in the midst of life? Or are we just about ourselves? Do we want to know Jesus or are we just happy to just know stuff about him? And Paul says, you know what? I'm not happy to know stuff about him. I want to know him. And knowing in the Greek means knowing with my understanding and my experience. When I say no, we talked about this last week, knowledge in the Greek, when when this Greek word is used to know, it's not talking about getting a head full of knowledge about something. It's talking about also experiencing. There's an experiential aspect to it. When the disciples walked with Jesus and they heard the teachings of Jesus and they saw what Jesus did and then they replicated and went and did that, change and transformation came into their world on the back of what they did. 
which was based on what they'd seen and what they'd heard. Transformation came. Knowledge puffs up, one of the ancient writers told us once. He said, knowledge puffs up. It just makes you proud because you know more about something than the person next to you. Well, it doesn't work that way in the Christian religion. It doesn't matter how much you know about God. Do you know God? The invitation from heaven to us is not just to know about, but to know. Mere mortals, human beings, get the chance to be reconnected to the divine creator of the universe. That's amazing. That's amazing. It sounds like a science fiction movie. <laughs> it kind of it sounds like this science fiction concept film, yet it's, it's what is revealed to us in the pages of these ancient documents. That God, the creator of the universe, wants to know us and wants us to know him. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how you feel about yourself this morning, but you're pretty special. You're pretty special. You know, when you went to school, maybe people didn't want to know you. Maybe in your workplace, certain people don't want to know you. Maybe in the sporting field, nobody wants to know you. Maybe in your own home, you want to have people that you feel like just don't want to know you. Anyone got kids? Sometimes they just don't want to know you until they need something. Then they want to know you. They want to experience you. But when it's me, I don't want to know you. Stay out of my life. Back up. Well, the most important authority in the universe, the one that said, let there be, and there was, that one actually wants to know you. Actually wants to know you. There's a cure for insecurity right there. Not a cure. I'm sure it's not a... I'm not... Don't come and get angry. Alan said all you've got to do is... No, no. But it's certainly a step in the right direction. Amen? That God. And Paul says here that I haven't quite got there yet. I haven't quite got there yet. None of us have either. But man, can God do some amazing things? Are you tapping your wife saying you haven't made it yet? Or what are you? <laughs> Bit of hustle and rib, rib rubbing going on there. I'm just thinking if that was my wife, it'd be because I'd said something. So Paul says, I haven't made it yet. He says, but one thing I do, I forget what's behind, I strain toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me onward. I love the terminology. He says, I press on. That word press on, it literally means this. It means to make, to run, or to flee. To make something run, or to make something flee. It means to put to flight. It means to drive away means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. In other words, it's not a casual stroll in any direction that you want. It's a determined, focused effort to move forward along a determined path towards a determined destination. What Paul's saying is, I have, I have a, a go- my goal is to know him, and I'm determined to know him. It's a path I'm heading on, and I'm not going to just sit back passively hoping I get to know him. I'm not going to sit back as a, as, as a spectator, so to speak, just hoping that because I go to church and because I've got a Bible in my house and because I prayed a prayer once upon a time and gave my life to Jesus, that hopefully I'll get to know him. What Paul's saying is, no, I've got things in my life, things in place. There's a deliberateness. It's not passive. It's deliberate. I'm going to know him. And I'm going after him. I'm straining to know him. This is not about salvation. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Amen. You cannot do anything to get to heaven, to to, to get through there, to to have your sins forgiven, to have that wall that separated you from God pulled. You can't do anything in your human strength and effort to do it. If you think you can, then you don't need Jesus. And you don't understand sin and you don't understand the cross. The only way you can be reconnected to the Father and have your sins forgiven is to surrender. That word surrender this morning. I love that word. Surrender your life over to Jesus. Accept the fact that A, you are a sinner, that B, Jesus died on a cross to deal with the consequence of your sin. And if you'll put your faith in him and live for him, those sins are removed and you now have relationship with God. It's kind of like this, right? So I've got Daniel here. First time I ever met Daniel, it went something like this. Hey, what's your name? I'm Alan. Oh, that's right. We, we didn't do any cool things back then. We were both un- We shook hands, right? And that was it. Now, guess what? We now have relationship. We've met, we've introduced, and so on. 
And most of us, or I shouldn't say most, a lot of people, that's their relationship with God in a nutshell there. One day when I was 19, I said, you're Jesus, I'm Alan, nice to meet you Jesus, thank you for all that you did on the cross for me. I'm so grateful that I can be reconnected to God and that you paid a price that I couldn't, thank you so much. And that's the extent of my relationship with him. And now I've walked away just hoping that that initial introduction, thinking that that's the maximum there is. Paul says, no, 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 it's more than just that. He says, I'm not only introducing myself, but I'm making a deliberate effort to sit down at the table and to get to know him and let him get to know me. I'm building a relationship with him. It's not just an introduction, it's a relationship. I want to know him in understanding and experience. Know him in understanding and experience. He says it's not casual, it's not a casual stroll in any direction. There's a deliberate direction, and I'm heading after it. I'm going after God. I want to know God. He says, I'm straining toward what is ahead. And that picture there is a picture of an athlete straining forward, a bit like me at the gym. I don't know if you can tell, I've been going back to the gym for a few weeks now. You can probably notice. Um, <coughs> Emperor's New Clothes, anyone ever heard that story, Emperor's New Clothes? Only the wisest can see my pecs. Um, and a picture of an athlete, and he's straining, he's reaching out, and there's veins bulging and popping, and every part of his being is engaged in getting to the end and grabbing a hold of that ribbon, that prize. That's the picture. So you can see here Paul saying the way that we get to know God is not just through a passive introduction at the beginning and then go on with the rest of our life just thanking him because I have my fire insurance certificate now tucked away for when I do go on that journey to the other side. Anyone, you, anyone ever go on a plane and you're searching for your passport or anyone married here and, 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 and you say to your wife, your husband or your partner, whatever, um, have you got the tickets, honey? And they're, oh, hang on, I put them in the sock drawer somewhere and no, I didn't, I put them... Well, we got our fire insurance ticket, so we just tuck it away somewhere now. And when we're going to go on the journey, we'll just pull it out then. And we'll just stand before the Lord and go, let me in, I got my ticket. And you know what? Because of the grace of God that saved you, but you're going to look back over your shoulder and go, hang on, you're God? You're? You can do what? You saw that? You, you mean you had an answer? But you, you wanted to ch- change that thing? Jeez, I wish I knew. I would have got to know you. I would have been deliberate about involving you in my life. Not just Sunday morning for two hours when I came along. Or not just when I went to the prayer meeting. I I would have involved you in my business when I was making decisions. and I would have involved you in my parenting. and I would have involved you in my finances. I would have involved you in those decisions. I would have involved you in my marriage. I, I just, I didn't know. Well, Paul's saying here, I'm going to give you a hint before you get there. You can know him. You can know him. And Paul says, that's my goal. I don't know about the rest of you, but my goal is to know him. And I am straining and striving and pressing on because I think that goal is worth putting everything into. I think that goal is worth reaching to. See, the goal is to know God, which produces in us a Christ-like life. The, the, The more we get to know him, the more he does what he does on the inside of us. And we become who we're meant to become. And as we become who we're meant to become, we're in a position to do what we're meant to do. So many people want to bypass knowing God and want to bypass becoming who they're meant to be. I just want to do what I'm meant to do, God. I just want to go out there and just do, 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 do for you, Jesus. He's saying, well, get to know me. Because it's the people that know me. It's people that know me that generally benefit from the byproduct of finding their calling, of, of, of experiencing their gifts, of seeing things. It, 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 it starts by getting to know me. It starts by getting to know me. So Paul's painting here a picture of a person pursuing their spiritual life with intent and focus and not passively just leaving it to chance. And if we're honest and without 
having to say anything to anyone, if I was to sit down with you, if, if, if God was to sit with you, if Jesus was here right now and walked up to you one-on-one and asked you the question, are you pursuing your spiritual life and your relationship with me or are you just sitting back passively hoping it happens? What would be your answer? What would be your answer? I, I hope that you could say like the Apostle Paul said, I'm pressing on. I'm straining. I'm striving because I want to know you, God. I want to know you in understanding and experience. I hope that that would be our answer. Well, if we're going to do what Paul's saying and passionately pursue the goal, which is knowing God, then we're actually going to have to make some decisions at some point in our life. At some point, we've got to make some decisions. And, And here's the thing. Maybe you're already doing these things and pursuing a knowledge of God. Or secondly, maybe you've never taken your pursuit of knowing God seriously. Hopefully you'll start now. Or maybe you once upon a time were pursuing the goal, but over time you've backed up and settled for where you're currently sitting. I don't know where you are on that scale. But here's the thing. At some point, we've got to make some decisions. And and there's a couple of decisions here that I I think uh, we see in the Word of God, and I just want to finish with this. Three little decisions. Number one, decide to remove any obstacles. Things that are stopping you from knowing God. Remove those obstacles from your life. See, Paul knew that he wasn't there yet. He knew he hadn't obtained it, but he was very focused in the direction that he was heading. So like a runner, he was committed to the removal of all distractions so that he could chase that one thing. You ever seen a runner or somebody preparing for an athletic event? They get very focused, don't they? They get very, very focused on on what they're out there to achieve. And they kind of drill down a little bit. You know, I I think in life today, one of the reasons, one of the big problems with the world we live in today is the access that we have to the amount of distractions that are available. I mean, once upon a time, I was listening to a a guy recently talking about his great-grandfather on a podcast, and he was a man of God, talking about his great-grandfather. And he said, you know, back in that day when my my great-great-grandfather was around, it was before internet and phones and all that stuff, and he said, you know what my great-great-grandfather did with his life? It was very simple. He loved his family. He loved God. He served his church, and he went to work. He said that was it. Four things, when I think back about my great grand, he had four things that were just basically summed up his whole world. Most nowadays have about 30 things that are summing up our world, don't we? We're pulled a bit over here and a bit over there, and we feel like because we're told that we can be anything we want, do anything we want, go anywhere we want, have any experience. We're kind of living in this world where we're being told that the horizons are broadening and broadening, and what it's really doing is it's not making us better, it's just simply diluting us from the things that are most important. It's like option fatigue. I remember when me and Jackie came back from India. Uh, we were living over there doing missions work. We came back from India and we landed. We had, we'd been out of the country for a couple of years at that point. Hadn't been back to the West. Landed at Sydney Airport. My brother-in-law picked us up, dropped us at his house. Then he went to work. It was the middle of winter. And of course, coming from central India, we had nothing for winter. So we decided that we would uh, uh, put uh, our two children in a little pram, they were small at the time, Caleb and Johnny, and we went down to a big shopping centre in uh, uh, Sutherland Shire, somewhere down there, to buy a jumper. And we were going to buy a jumper for Jackie. And I remember we walked down the road, we didn't have a car, so we walked in, you know, the down the highway with the pram, got to the shopping centre, went in, we went up the stairs, we looked around, there's just, I mean, it's just overkill. The amount of shops is overkill. And, and so we're kind of getting all discombobulated by the amount of shops. Anyway, we just decided we're just going to go to Target. That's our focus is Target. We went to Target, we opened the door, walked into Target, we pushed the pram, we stopped, we looked up, and there in front of us was about 30 different designs of women's jumpers, 50 different colours, cuts, round necks, V-necks, no necks. And and, and we looked up and we looked at this and we just froze for a second, ended up looking at each other without saying a word. We turned around, walked back out, back down the street, went back into my brother-in-law's place, pulled the curtain, sat on the lounge and went, what world have we come to? See, in India, if you want to buy a jumper, there's three types and two colours. Take your pick. You can be in and out like that. You go to a shop here, whoo. 
So much choice. And life is like that for most of us in the West now too. There are so many things to choose from that we can get so diluted if we don't really know what are the most important things. And one of the most important things, I believe, for us as Christians is to get to know God. It's got to be one of the most important parts of our world. It's got to be a priority. Otherwise, it gets diluted down and we end up with time for everything else, but we've got no time to invest into our spiritual growth or our spiritual life. Hebrews 12 verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's just talked about all these great men and women of faith, people that, 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 that would not deny Jesus to the very end of their life and some of them it cost them their life. He says, Because we've got these guys basically watching us, let us watch this, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us Lay, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. We all understand, throw off the sin that so easily We understand that, don't we? Okay, yeah, we want to throw off sin because it, it, it pulls us back from God and slows us down. So we all understand getting rid of sin, but it doesn't just say sin. He says everything that hinders. So there's sin, but there's also things that hinder. They might not necessarily be sin. They mightn't be bad, but are they the best? Are they just simply distractions in this life that are pulling you away from whatever you decide are the most important handful of things? Because none of us can do everything and be everything. But the big problem is you don't know if you're being distracted if you don't know what you're meant to be focused on. Isn't that right? How do you, how do you know that that's a distraction if you don't actually even know what you're meant to be focused on? Before you want to know what a distraction is, you've got to determine what the focus is. And most of us don't live a focused enough life to know what's really, really important here. And one of the most important things is our relationship with God. We have this opportunity to get to know God, not wait till we get to heaven, but to get to know him here. So what's stopping you from pursuing God? Is it distractions? For some people, it might be social media. You know, when you, when you look at research studies, the amount of time people spend on Facebook, um, Twitface, um, whatever they are, it's Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Hours and hours and hours that a couple of generations ago would have been spent maybe with time with your family, maybe playing a game with your kids, maybe in prayer, maybe serving in your church, maybe serving in the community. And now it's getting eaten up watching cat videos. Oh, look at the cat rolling down the stairs. Oh, oh there's another cat. Look, oh, I found another cat. Look at another cat. Too many other interests. Some of us need to pull back from what's good in order to pursue that which is great. Because the reality is every time we say yes to something, we're saying no to something else. Amen? Every time I say yes and give my time to this, I'm saying no to something else. And that something else may be better. But I'll never know if I don't know what I'm pursuing and where I'm heading. Second thing is that we've got to decide to create some spiritual momentum in our lives. Momentum is a beautiful thing, isn't it? You can get a car and, and, and put that car here and put a, a, a brick in front of that car and try to, 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 to push that car over that brick, and it takes so much effort, time, energy, you may not even get it over it. Because it's amazing how that little thing can stop momentum of something really big. But if you get that car into first gear, then second gear, then third gear, then you hit that brick, guess what? Boof. Straight over the top of it. There's something about creating momentum in the areas of our life that are important. So do things that help us to know God. Paul knew that it was going to take some effort. It was not just going to happen to him because he was Paul the Apostle and a Christian. Paul realized, hey, just because Jesus appeared to me, blinded me, and gave me such an amazing amount of revelation, guess what? It's not just going to happen for me. I've still got to press in and strain and strive and get to know God, have a focus and a goal, and go after knowing God. He said, even for me, even for me. It would have been easy for Paul to go, you know what? I don't, I've made it. I mean, how many of you guys have been walking to Damascus one day and been blinded by lights? Huh? Heard a voice say to you, you know, what are you doing? Said back to that voice, who are you, Lord? Told that, you know, you're going to be blinded and go to straight street and the dude's going to pray for you. And then the guy comes and I'm so important that this guy comes and goes, you don't know me, but I know you. God spoke to me and said, you're Paul and I'm going to, Saul, sorry, I'm not going to come pray. I mean, that's pretty, I've kind of made it. I've made it. But he said, no, I haven't. I haven't. I'm pressing in. So deciding to create spiritual momentum. What habits or routines do you have that help create and sustain momentum in your pursuit of God? Do you have any habits? 
Do you have anything in your life that you know deliberately is helping you build that opportunity to get to know God? Do you have regular routines or habits in your world that are going to help do that? Do you have set time to get into the Word of God? Do you have any set time where you pray? Do you have a place where you can practice the discipline of silence before God? That's an art and a discipline that we just seem to have lost in the world we live in today. It's too fast, it's too active. Yet, yet the, the old uh, fathers of, of, of Christianity and mothers of Christianity in, 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 in the early church, they used to practice silence and solitude. Just being quiet before the Lord. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yeah, the world's, world's going to hell in a handbag, so to speak, and all kinds of bad things are happening. But you know what? Stop. Be still for a second and just know, hey, I will be exalted. I will be. I don't care what's going on out there. I'm going to be exalted. I don't care what's happening out there. I'll be lifted up. I don't care how bad it looks out there. I'll win. At the end of the day. So be still. Be still and know I'm God. Do you have time in your world for stillness and solitude? Do you have people that you've opened yourself up to for discipleship? Do you have people? When I first got saved at 19, one of the first things I did was I straight away found older Christian men. And I used to, some of them probably hated it, but I used to knock on their door at 11 o'clock at night because I didn't have any etiquette or know what was right or wrong anyway, period, with families. So I just did whatever I wanted. And there'd be some nights where 11 o'clock at night I'd knock on their door. And they'd open up their door for me, rub their eyes, and I'd be thinking, what are you in bed for? It's only 11. I've got kids now, now I know why they're in bed. You know? And they'd make me a cup of tea, and they'd sit down with me and they'd just talk to me, and I'd just ask them questions about God, and they'd ask me things. Ever since I first got saved, I've always had people that I pursued, and here's the key, I pursued them. I didn't sit back waiting for them to go, oh, he's so important, he needs... Uh, no, 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 I took it upon myself. My growth in God was my responsibility, and I went after those people. To this day, I'm 50 years of age, I still have those people. I still have people that I have deliberately pursued and gone, we need to have a regular connection because I need you to speak into my life. I need to be honest and transparent and open with you because I, I know that part, that is part of the process of me knowing God is to open myself up transparently to discipleship by somebody else. But sitting back waiting for somebody else to do that, it's amazing how many people just... Sit back. We don't take initiative. We want to. We, we think that I think that my growth in God is your responsibility. It's not. It's not. It's mine. I have access to the Father. It's not. The curtain was torn in two. So there's no separation, no veil between me and God or you and God now. I don't need to go through these people to get to God, but I do need these people to speak into my world to help me grow in my relationship and understanding and knowledge of God. So I reached out for these people. Do you have people in your world that you've chased up that are mentoring and discipling you? Or are you waiting for people to discover how great you are? John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. He says, if you remain in me and I in you, he says, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And the nothing he's talking about is bearing the kind of fruit that he wants you to bear. That's what he, of course, you can do things apart from Christ, can't you? It's like that verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you jump off this building and not go splat? Probably not. There are some limits. Don't take things out of context. He's not saying, apart from me, you can't do anything. You're just going to sit there blubbering and drooling in a chair. He's not saying that. Okay? What he's saying is, apart from me, you won't bear the kind of fruit that the kingdom wants you to bear. You will never be fully who you're meant to be and do fully what you're meant to do apart from me, staying attached to the vine. A tree, once it's planted and established with its roots down deep, it'll produce fruit consistently. So fruit's a byproduct of having a strong and deep root system. And that's what your spiritual habits are, those things that give you momentum. They're that deep root system that go down into the ground. And if you have a deep root system, the byproduct of that is you will grow and you will produce fruit. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the vine. Hang in there with me. Stay connected to me. Keep your roots deep down in me and you won't be straining and striving. Oh, I've got to make an apple pop off. Ah! No, no, no. Guess what? Apple just pops off. 
The straining isn't happening out there on the branch for the apple to pop off. The straining is going on beneath the surface as the roots are reaching out for water. It's the unseen stuff that produces the seen stuff. And it's the same in our spiritual worlds. And the third thing, once we've got momentum, we've got to decide to continue on with that progress. As Paul said, he could have easily, at that point of his life, hung his hat up, hung his boots up and gone, you know what, I've made it. I think I've done enough. I've pressed in enough. I've strained enough. I've strived enough. I think I'm there. I deserve a sabbatical. I deserve a holiday from my relationship with God. Amen? But he didn't. He said, I'm still pressing and I'm still straining and I'm still striving because I want to know God. I want to know God. Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, Therefore let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. We, we, we still want to be taken forward. Uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 17 and 18 says, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, as in your, your faith, your place in God. He said, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. So we need to be growing in our grace, growing in the knowledge of our Lord. 1 Peter 2, 2. Like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow in your salvation. It's not a stagnant pool. It's a flowing stream. It's not something passive where we sit back and hope it happens. It's something we participate in. Paul prays for the Colossians in Colossians 1.10. He says, he prays for them so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. He says, I'm praying for you that you don't get to that point where you just stagnate, but you keep pressing and you keep straining and you keep striving and you keep going after a knowledge and understanding and experience of God. That you keep going after that. Psalm 92, verse 12 to 14. It says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still, I love this one, where's Del? Del, this is especially for you. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Amen? Still bearing fruit. In old age. How many is in this room still bearing fruit in old age? Anybody else? Keith, yep, we've got a couple here. It's great. It tells me that you're not going to get to a point, whether it be either spiritually or even uh, in your age physically, get to a point where we hang our hand up and go, yeah, we've made it. We don't need to press into God anymore. We don't need to get to know God anymore. No, no, even when you're old, the promise is if you press in, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to be fresh and green. Who wants to be fresh and green? Amen. How'd the saints go last night, by the way? They got up, didn't they? Swanee's got up, didn't they? I was thinking of you last night. By one, oh, wow, they were winning by about 30 at one point when I saw it. There you go. There you go. I, I was going to call the police. I could hear all the noise coming from your flat. So, you better calm down. Something's going to happen here. Still bear fruit in their old age. Here's the thing. Are we prepared to pursue God? Do we want to know God? Do we want to know God or are we happy just to know about God? Knowing that if we get to know God, then the byproduct of that will be, you know what? There'll be increased power in your prayer. You'll, you'll find and you'll feel and you'll experience your prayer life come alive more if you make pursuing God and knowing God your goal. Know God, get to know God. You'll find that you have greater authority in the spiritual realm. I don't know if everybody here believes there's a spiritual dimension or you think this is all there is to life. I believe there's more than this, and I believe Jesus taught there was more than this, and I believe that we've been given authority even in that space where angels and demons fly around and do what they do. We've been given authority, and we have authority. But you know what? Trying to have authority, it, 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 it's, it's like being a fake policeman trying to exercise the authority of the New South Wales Police Service, but you're not a real policeman, and everybody that, that you're standing in front of trying to stop knows you're not a real policeman. Well, they're not going to stop for you, are they? They're just going to keep on going. Why? Because you're not a real policeman. You might dress like one, have a badge, but you're not a real policeman. But if you're a real policeman, and you are connected to the New South Wales Police Force, and they know that, they're going to stop, and they're going to listen. Well, I believe it's kind of the same in the spiritual realm too, when we get to know God. 
when we're people that know God, that walk with God, we find that there's greater authority in those areas. There's more of a flow of healing power. I don't know about you, but I, 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 I believe in healing. I believe that there should be more healing that takes place. Physical healing, emotional, mental, psychological. I believe in the healing power of God. I believe that Jesus healed people. But I'm also smart enough to know that I'm not seeing that same degree of healing power right now. And it's not because I can find a use-by date in here. I can't. So I'm looking back going, well, God, there's other reasons why. There's other reasons why, God. So, Lord, do some soul searching in here. What well, Maybe, just maybe, just maybe it's because we want God to be the same God we read about in here, but we don't want to be the same people we read about in here. Just maybe. Just maybe. God, would you do all the miracles and the, and the power of God and grow your church and do all the things that you did in here, God? That's what we want to see. And God goes, yes, that's my heart's desire too. And I'm going to ask you one thing. Would you just simply be those people? Oh, hang on, that's a bit that's a bit unfair, God. Why? They were real human beings. And they did it once. Can we do it again? Can we be that passionate for God? Can God be that central to our world? Can the kingdom be that important to us again? I know we're scientific. I know we've moved on. I know we've got fancy cars and we can fly around the world. I get that. Okay? I know that we've got sport on the weekends. I know that that that, that we've got to, you know educate our kids. I know that we've got to have time for our marriages. I, I, I understand that. I know we've got to pay our mortgages. I, 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 know, I know all that. I know all that. But he's the same yesterday, today and forever. And is he as important to me? And, I'm, and, and these are challenges. When I'm, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to us. And I'm challenging myself with this. Is, God, are you that important to me like I read in here that you were to these people? And I'm not talking about becoming some weird spiritual thing that locks himself in an igloo and sits back going, no, nah. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a Christianity that was lived out there in the world, a Christianity that was lived so well that it actually says in the times of the early church that the community around them revered the church, realized there was something special about those people that followed Jesus. What about the ability to speak with authority? Man, when these guys spoke, stuff happened. We speak now and we just go, just believe in faith, something's going to happen. Mate, these guys spoke and stuff happened. They spoke about Jesus. They said, man, the thing that separates you, Jesus, from the Pharisees is not the fact that, 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 that you've got more Bible knowledge than them. I mean, they both had Bible knowledge. They both had different interpretations. But what they said was, when Jesus speaks, he's one who speaks with authority. There's something about the power that comes out of the words of that man's mouth because he knows God. He's connected to God. And when you hear preachers like that who know God, don't you know that? You sit there and you hear them and you can tell in the words that these guys know God. There's an authority that comes. One of my favorite preachers is one of the most non-charismatic guys I ever know. Anyone ever heard of Jack Hayford? I love Jack Hayford. Any of you? I love Jack Hayford. And I watch him though and he's kind of certainly not, you know, He's just fairly monotone stuff, but I'm telling you, when that guy speaks, and he might take 10 minutes to say what I can say in 33 seconds because I talk really fast, but when he speaks, there's just something, there's authority on those words, and you just sit there, and I'm going, oh, that's piercing my heart, man. Wouldn't you want to be like that? I want to be like that. I want to be like that when I'm talking to people about Jesus. I don't want them to be able to go, yeah, well, that's good for you because you need that. No, I want those words to pierce their heart to have the power of God behind them where they can't just fob it off. I want them to go, geez, I'm, I'm confronted by something here. I've got to wrestle with this. I've got to think about that. Well, that's, that's what happens. The more we get to know God, these are the byproducts. We don't pursue these things. We pursue God. These are some of the byproducts of knowing God. I want more sensitivity to the activity of the Holy Spirit around me. You know, the Holy Spirit is doing things everywhere all the time. Are we sensitive to it? Do we know? Are we aware of it? Are we aware of it? When we go to work, are we aware? Are we aware what the Holy Spirit's doing in your workplace? Because he's doing something. I don't know what he's doing. I'm not there. But he's doing something because he loves them. He's doing something. We come to church sometimes and, you know, I get people, and we've all seen this before, you know, people come and tell you what the Holy Spirit was doing in church and you missed the mark because you didn't this and you didn't that and you should have this and should have that. Hey, that's fine. That might be how you read it, how I read it. We might read it differently. That's fine. But hey, do you know what the Holy Spirit's doing in your family? Are you sensitive enough? Do you know him well enough? Do you know what the Holy Spirit's doing in your workplace? Do you know what the Holy Spirit's doing in your school? Because he's doing something. Wouldn't you, don't we want to be sensitive enough to that? Well, go after the goal. Go after God. Relationship with God. I'll finish with this. It's one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible. John 12, 42 to 43. 
It says, yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in Jesus. These guys believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith. For fear they'd be put out of the synagogue. It goes on, it says, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Their priority was different. It was more about down here and not so much about up there. It was more about their own kingdom, their own reputation, their own image than it was God. But, but the sad thing is this, that these guys actually believed in him, but they didn't want to know him. They believed in him, but they didn't want to know him. And I think somewhere along the line, maybe we've been tricked into thinking that Christianity is about believing in God. It's about knowing God. Every religion believes in a God. Woo-hoo, we believe in God. James says, you know what? Demons in hell believe in God. <laughs> but they tremble. And we're not called just to believe in God. Through the cross, through the death of Jesus, we've been given an opportunity to get to know God. And I know that sounds way too good to be true, but it's true. It's true. We have the opportunity to know God. And, and, and I, I hope and pray at these last three weeks, we've been looking at what Paul says, that we understand that the goal here, what Paul's talking about, he says, I'm going to leave everything behind. I'm going to let go of the guilt, going to let go of the condemnation, going to let go of all that stuff because I'm looking ahead and I'm running towards a goal. And that goal is I want to get to know God and I'm not going to let anything slow me down or stop me. And I hope and I pray that that would be our heart and our passion because I just am so convinced that he did it once with a bunch of people that had that kind of heart. And I reckon God can do it again. God can do something amazing again. But he's not just going to do it because we passively sit back and think, got my fire insurance ticket. Can I encourage you? Press into God. Get to know God. Maybe your path may be different to mine. I don't know. As long as it's through Jesus, get to know God. Amen. Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord. God, I thank you for your word, God. And, and, and God, what an amazing thought that we have the opportunity to get to know you. And God, I, I'm, I, I agree with Paul. I have not attained it. I am not there yet. I've got a long, long way to go. And I've got distractions and I've got all kinds of things going on. But Lord, I just pray, would you give each of us the strength and the focus to know that this short stint we have down here, if we would just get to know you, everything else will be better. All the other stuff will be byproducts because you separated that wall between us, not so we could have ministries, not so we could heal the sick, not so that we could uh, write books, not so that we could become millionaires, not so we could live in the best neighbourhoods, not so we could be the most popular people or have the most Twitter followers. You pulled that down so that we can come straight to you, face to face and get to know you, Lord. So Holy Spirit, just take us on that journey, Father, I pray. And Lord, in the next seven days as we leave this place, Lord, give us a chance to tell somebody about you, Lord. The people out there that do not have hope, uh, do not know Jesus Christ, do not know about the death, the burial, resurrection, would you give us the opportunity as your mouthpieces, your hands and your feet, to tell them and to show them about the goodness of a God that loves them so much that he died for them, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen.